Um, let me begin by saying a huge thank you for turning out to hear my lecture this evening. It's cold outside, it's getting near Christmas, and the country's in a bit of a state, so actually of you taking time out to come and listen to my lecture um, is really warming, and I do appreciate it, so let's hope it's worth it. <laughs> okay, I posed this title because I thought it was quite interesting. Who owns the sea and why does it matter? Now, having posed this question or set of questions, I'm now going to add a caveat. And the caveat is that I'm not going to answer the question that I've posed. Because as an academic, um, I never let a little bit of nuance stand in the way of a good title, a good set of headlines here. More seriously though, um, the reason why I'm not going to answer this question is probably because we just simply don't have the data. We don't have the evidence to actually know who owns the sea. If we think about the oceans, they cover 70% of the planet. It's a massive space. We've got the water column, we've got the seabed, we've got the subsoil underneath it. We've got fisheries, we've got shipping, we've got minerals, we've got renewable energy. We've got 198 or so countries, some of them landlocked, all vying for control of space. In addition to all the companies and individuals who conduct activities at sea. It would be a massive undertaking to actually work this out. And even if I could do that, it would probably be a tedious lecture going X, Y, and Z owns X, Y, and Z. So what I wanted to do instead was to think a little bit more widely about how ownership and control come about and the role that law plays in the process of constructing the oceans, constructing ownership. And to think a little bit about what that tells us as a society and some of the challenges and the problems that it presents to us. And this is important because I think if you read the newspapers, if you look at any specialist articles, magazines, the research and the information out there tells us that the oceans are in a pretty poor state. We're overfishing them. We're dumping a waste in them. They're being flooded with plastics. So what we're doing at the moment doesn't really seem to be working. So it's important for us to understand a little bit about how things work and maybe why they aren't working. So my lecture is going to take us through some of these things. Um, and at the end, I'll try and finish on a slightly more positive note and think about maybe what we can do going forward to try and change that state of affairs. Anyway, so that's what I plan to do. The reality might be something slightly different, time permitting. So, um, a bit like a play, a narrative, I've got a lecture in four parts here. So in the first part of this, I'm going to set the scene, talk a little bit about the oceans, but more specifically, the values that we attach to them. And the reason why I'm starting there is because, as a lawyer, I love the law, and I want to understand how it works, but I also appreciate that law is instrumental. It's often there to achieve other social, economic, and political ends. So if we want to know what the law is doing, and if it's doing it well, we need to know what the purpose of the law is. So the first part of my lecture will talk a little bit about that. Then, in the second part of my lecture, I'm going to talk about lines and legalities. The oceans are different. A common theme, meme, within my lecture is to explore the difference between the oceans and land territory, because law works differently at sea. And the point I probably want to emphasize there is that when we start thinking about how law enables control over the oceans, it does it differently, often by drawing lines, but also when we think about how law operates, there is a greater degree of pressure on law to deliver because there are other mechanisms for ensuring control aren't working so strongly. So the law has to be very legitimate and it also has to be very effective in terms of attracting compliance. Then, time permitting, I'm going to get on to say something about ownership. Because I did say I was going to talk about who owns the oceans. But in this section, I'm not really going to be talking about the who's and the why's. I'm going to be thinking a little bit more deeply about what justifies ownership. And now I'll go back and have a look at some theories and concepts of ownership and the justifications of that and show how they might apply to the seas. And then wrapping it all up together, I'll then provide some options for the future. Are you with me? Yes. Wow, that's good. Okay. Um, part one. 
what do we value and um, what value do we place on the ocean? So as I said, law's instrumental, and so we need to think about the values that we place upon the oceans. Any good lecture always starts with some facts and figures, and it says something about how important the topic is. You've got to justify what you're speaking about. So let's start with some economics or some data here. In 2012, the Rio Plus 20 conference developed this notion of the blue economy. And the idea of the blue economy is that if the oceans are in a healthy, a good condition, then we can exploit them for better value. It was also about developing the potential of the oceans in order to sustain some of the society, some of the needs, some of the development needs that we have around the world. So the idea was that we're kind of maximizing exploitation of land, so let's turn our eye to the oceans and see if we can develop them further to help improve our ability to go forward as a society. And in doing so, this generated quite a lot of interest about the blue economy. But it started really with the idea of trying to value what the oceans are worth. If we're going to develop a blue economy, we need to know what the value of that economy is going to be. So the OECD, for example, has valued the current oceans as producing each year $1.5 trillion worth of value. And this is expected to double by 2030. Currently, ocean capital is somewhere in the region of about $24 trillion. So to come back to my initial question, why does it matter? Well, if we know who owns the oceans, we know who owns a slice of that great big pie up there. So I guess it's important that we understand ownership. But the problem I have when I start with things like economic value and dollar values is that it starts to portray the oceans as a commodity. And the oceans aren't just a commodity. They are valuable, but they are something more than that. Also, if we start to portray the oceans purely in terms of commodities, it starts to perpetuate the idea that the oceans are only there to be exploited. And this isn't the only set of values which I think can and should inform the way we view the oceans. So let's look a little bit more widely. Okay, so as I said here, part of the problem is that when we view the oceans in dollar terms, we tend to commodify the oceans. And what that will do is it will push us to try and exploit more of that resource. So on the left-hand slide uh, of the slide here, I've just got an image of the Dutch um, maritime zone. And what this map shows here is the kind of scale and range of different activities, dredging, offshore wind energy generation, there's some marine protected areas in there, there are fishing grounds, there are dumping zones, there are sites for military activities to take place. The Netherlands is a pretty small country, but we can already see how intensive ocean use is. And that raises the question as to whether or not actually valuing the oceans and producing them as a commodity is the best way forward. Is it risking things collapsing? There are other values which attach to the oceans. So let's have a look a little bit at literature. I like things, I'm mixing things up here. Dominic, you still with me? Good, excellent. Okay, so other values which attach to them. Painting by Turner, the fighting Temeraire here. Um, it pictures a battleship which has just finished a conflict at sea. I think it's kind of interesting here. It, it makes the point for me. The oceans through history have been a contested space, sometimes for war, but perhaps more often than not for other values. The oceans are a barrier between states, but they're also a bridge between states. They're a site where states move into and they project their values. They try and present them against other states, and we can have dialogue and we can have practice between states about what is important about the ocean and how we use it. So it's a site of interstate interactions. So when we think about international law, it's that process of interaction which can sometimes create value and create ideas. But of course, that's only interactions by states. I'm not sure about the rest of us. So some other values here. Um, we've got the Great Wave. Um, I really like this one because what it says is that basically the oceans are powerful. They're beyond our control. We've got a tiny fishing vessel at risk of capsizing there. 
So in terms of how we value and we perceive the oceans, we often see them as being a space outside of states, but also beyond our control. Somewhere we would like to exert control, somewhere we'd like to civilize, but sometimes beyond our ability to control. Another example. Everybody's familiar, but probably hasn't read The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner here. Um, a classic of literature by um, Coleridge. Um, the memes or the th ideas behind this are that the oceans are sometimes an unknown space full of unexpected perils here. But also there is a lesson here when the albatross is shot. It invites bad luck onto the vessel and ultimately results in its doom. And the only survivor here is then destined to a life of telling everybody about the perils that he's undertaken and how woeful his life is. But it also speaks to the idea that the oceans, again, are outside of society and that they are actually something which is infrequently used or understood, but also ones which generate senses of loneliness and detachment. So again, we've got another set of values which attach to this. And again, another classic here, Moby Dick. Um, the oceans are seen as a space, a space of freedom, a space where we can quest, a space where there is opportunity to explore and exploit. But also the oceans are a place where if we go and we pursue our own self-interest, our own ego, then we do so at our own peril. Um, it tells us that if we are far too reliant on ourselves, then things are likely to go wrong, as Captain Ahab found out here. There's also some interesting lessons about property in uh, Moby Dick. So for example, there's a nice discourse on who actually is entitled to own ship and fish. And it's basically first come, first serve. So kind of basic echoes of how property might be constructed culturally when it happens at sea. It's also got terrible undertones of slavery as well, I'm afraid. So we've got Pitt the cabin boy, who is largely disregarded and abused, um, and he's commodified as somebody who can be used for the benefits of others. And this speaks to the idea that sometimes beyond states, property works, unfortunately, in, in, in bad ways. So we've got all these different types of value which can be sometimes used to help us understand the oceans. Another set of values which is coming in more recently is the idea of rights of nature. A lot of what I've said before is about how we project our values onto the oceans, how we anthropocentrize them, how we treat them as a commodity. Increasingly, there's a concern now for the idea that nature is an equal partner in society. We don't view ourselves as apart from it. And this is generating some interesting ideas about how we value it and how we value our interactions with the oceans. And I'll come back to this later. So a couple of key summary points here. Oceans are spaces where many different values interact, and that's important. They're a site for value creation. The oceans are a space which is different to land. When things happen at sea, they happen differently. And in part, that's due to the fluid, the dynamic nature of the oceans, and the fact that they are distant from many centers of society. But there's also some questions here about whose values prevail. I said a lot about states and international law and about how they project their values. One of the problems that we have, perhaps, in terms of the construction of the oceans, how we design ocean regimes, is the fact that many important voices simply aren't heard. But I'll come back to that one later. So that's the context. Sorry, um, that was quite long. So let's move on to some thoughts about how law interacts and how law advances some of these values. So in this part of the lecture, I want to talk a little bit about the construction of ocean space. The idea is that, yes, the oceans are a space, but the oceans themselves aren't simply a space. They are a site where values interact, and law has an important role in creating and establishing those values. So I'll begin with some lessons from history just to show how some of that has played out. I'll then talk a little bit about what this has resulted in and, and come back to the question of who owns the oceans. And then I'll say something briefly about the construction process. Oops. Okay, so going back in time, history. Um, one of the earliest legal regimes which was developed for the oceans was formulated in the Treaty of Tordesillas of 1494. This was a, an international agreement between Spain and Portugal. They were two major maritime powers. And basically what they decided between them was to carve the world into two parts. They drew a line 
down the meridian of the ocean, about 100 miles west of the Azor Islands. And basically everything to the west of that was given to Spain, and everything to the east of that was given over to Portugal. Spain and Portugal, they were powerful Catholic states, and so this was endorsed by the Pope at a time when natural law meant something. Didn't matter that there were people living in these different societies or these different parts of the world. They belonged to Spain and Portugal. Now, clearly, the rest of Europe wouldn't take that lying down. And so this generated quite an intense debate about how to control the oceans. And a leading advocate, somebody who challenged the carving up of the oceans between Spain and Portugal, was the Dutch jurist Hugo de Grotius. Um, about 21 years old, he wrote a major manuscript on international law. He was advising states and governments. So he was a bit of a go-getter for his time. But what he did was to challenge the idea that natural law, God-given law, as dictated by the Pope and by Catholic states, was something which we have to take as a given. And he advanced the idea of freedom of the high seas, the idea that the seas, by their nature, by human reason, were open to all states. They were a common space. Sounds great, it sounds idealistic, and to an extent it was. But let's not forget, though, that Dutch um, had employed Hugo de Groot, um, or the East, Dutch East Indies had employed him, to basically advocate against the Spanish and Portuguese claims, because the Dutch wanted a piece of the action. And the only way they could do this was by basically maintaining free navigational rights through what was claimed to be owned by um, Spanish and Dutch um, waters. He was challenged by somebody called John Selden. He was an English jurist, and he didn't like what um, Grotius was saying. At the time, England was an emerging maritime power, and so he advocated the notion of mariclausum, the idea the seas were closed, that they could be closed off by states and exclusively used by them. Known as the Battle of the Books, this set the kind of template for how the law of the sea would develop here, the idea of inclusive and exclusive use of the oceans. But what we have is states basically projecting their political, their policy aims onto the oceans and using that to carve them up, perhaps regardless of what other values existed. So let's zoom forward 400 or so years to the present date. And this is what the oceans look like today when we draw lines on a map. We can see who owns what, well, in rough terms. But basically all states, at least those with a coastline, are entitled to claim maritime zones, a 12 mile territorial sea within which they've got exclusive control subject to limited rights of navigation. And beyond that, stretching out to 200 nautical miles, an exclusive economic zone where they have sovereign rights for the purposes of exploring and exploiting natural resources. Basically, they get anything of value which is in the coastal waters next to the sea. And if that's not enough, we also have the continental shelf, the seabed and subsoil beneath the seas, which can sometimes extend out to around about 350 nautical miles. What this means is that round about 142 states control round about 50% of the oceans. And the bit that's left in the middle is the high seas, and that's left for everybody to use in common. But we have the carving up of the oceans. So I suppose to come back to my original point, then it's states who own or control the oceans. But it's not just states owning or controlling the oceans equally. As this little chart shows, it's the top 10 of ocean owners, as it were. I could show you the, the, the remaining 142, but you get an idea of who the major beneficiaries of ocean control are. So right at the top, we've got France, not the biggest state, but by virtue of its colonial possessions, its overseas territories, it generates a massive maritime entitlement. Again, the UK, number five, not quite Eurovision prospects, but still pretty high up on the charts there. Again, it's got a massive maritime zone. Now, this is important because when we think about who controls or owns the oceans, it's not divided up on principles of equity or fairness or need. It's done according to geography. Your ability to claim maritime space is effectively generated by the size and shape of your coastline. And if the geographic dice have rolled favorably, then you get a great big chunk of the oceans. And if you're not, if you're like Germany, where you're kind of tied in between the Netherlands and Denmark, you get a really small maritime zone. So geography is critical. But of course, that suggests that geography is somehow neutral in the process. Why do we use geography? Well, because states decided to use geography. 
And obviously that benefited the top 10 nations, at least over time. We've got other claims to the oceans. This is the deep seabed. So we've got further propertization or control, exclusive control of ocean space. The clarion clipperton zone here, carved up between about 10, 11 states and private consortium. And basically these are claims to access the mineral resources of the deep seabed. And these are seen as increasingly vital for green energy. So it's cobalt, copper, other rare materials which we need for our green technology that power our batteries, our phones and our cars. Again, we have significant claims by leading states to access these resources. But this has largely been done on a first come, first serve basis. And this has generally favoured those states with the technology to exploit the deep seabed. So we're talking about Western developed states. We're not talking about the poor economies around the world. So coming back to this idea of geography, um, this is a little bit of law, at least. Everything else has been policy and philosophy and ideas. But we've got a case here. We've got the North Sea Continental Shelf case of 1969, a seminal legal case in international law which set out how we delimit our continental shelves, how we carve up the seabed adjacent to our coastlines. And as part of this decision, it articulated the concept that the land dominates the sea. So the idea here, again, is that territory, the power of states, is projected onto the sea, and that justifies the maritime claims and entitlements that we've got. Of course, this is a little bit of a fiction, though, the idea that the land does dominate the sea. Sea level rise. It reveals the limits of this approach here. We're all aware global warming is causing sea levels to rise. In some countries, this is merely eroding more quickly coastlines. But for some states, this is an existential threat, particularly if you're a small island developing state in the Pacific, where you're largely based on reefs and atolls. A couple of inches can make your land uninhabitable. It can remove your access to fresh water. And if sea levels continue to rise, then ultimately it can result in the loss of statehood altogether. So, geography is only useful so far. But what's interesting now is that many of the states who are at threat from sea level rise are turning to other mechanisms for defining their claims. They're no longer saying that their maritime entitlements will be determined by their coastline because their coastline will disappear. They're starting to fix points on maps which will guarantee them control of ocean space regardless of their territory disappearing. So again, it shows how Certain policy drives can shape the way in which we control or make claims over ocean space. Now, I'm not going to complain about them doing that. I'm not a fan of geography, and I think there are important reasons to do this. For equity, why should they suffer because of industrialization causing climate change, for which they haven't contributed to? So the idea that they should be able to maintain these entitlements should be driven by more equitable concerns. Now, change of tax slightly. So I've talked a little bit about who owns things, but I want to say something very briefly about the problems of identifying ownership. And I want to say something briefly about the kind of hidden patterns of control. So when I talked a little bit about the idea that in history, certain states dictated, set the template for how the seas develop, these ideas still continue today, but they're not always apparent in the law. So we've got the idea that sometimes the historical process creates ways of doing things which aren't obvious to us now. And unless we see how that's happened, we don't sometimes understand how things are going to happen in the future. But in addition to those kind of hidden historical patterns, we've also got challenges of corporate ownership and structure and identifying actually, even within states, who does own some of these ocean spaces. So we've got the recent example here of Nauru. Now, Nauru, tiny small island developing state, about 11,000 people live in Nauru. Um, but it's host to Nori, the, Na the Nauru Ocean um, Construction Incorporation, which is basically a company which hosts one of those claims to the deep seabed. However, Nori is actually owns, or pretty much a whole owned subsidiary, of something called the Metals Company, which is a Canadian corporation. And it's the Canadian corporation which has the technology, the resources to exploit the seabed.
And so what we have here is a kind of collaboration, a joint venture between a very weak state and a very powerful mining corporation. I'll ask you the question, I won't answer this one, who do you think really owns the claim which Nauru is making to the deep seabed? Interestingly, in July last year, Nauru invoked what's called the two-year rule. Basically, although we have claims to the deep seabed, we don't have any rules which govern these activities. But in the convention, there is a rule which governs this. There's a rule which states that states can invoke the two-year rule, which basically means that unless the International Seabed Authority, which sets out the rules for how mining takes place, gets its act together and develops rules for mining, then if it doesn't do so within two years, it will have to then start considering mining license applications. And to do so on the basis of any information that it has, but also with a presumption it, that it will grant those licenses. So what we have here is a strong corporate process, which is perhaps pushing the way in which we exploit ocean resources in a potentially harmful and hazardous direction. Another example of hidden ownership. We all love renewable energy, and in the UK, Renewable energy is basically at least activity at sea. So companies will approach the government, and in particular the Crown Estates Commission, in order to obtain the rights to use the seabed for putting in place offshore wind farms. This generates a huge amount of revenue, around about five billion for the UK. But what's interesting is that actually most of the sites which we've now leased out in the North Sea are actually state-owned corporations in other countries. So for example, we've got Dong Energy from, the Nether uh, from Denmark, has about 24%. We've got Endura from Norway, which has about 9% of these spaces. So even though the UK claims exclusive control, actually the activities and the revenues from them are perhaps going to foreign states. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the values at play. I've talked a little bit about how law has a role to play in constructing those values. And I've also talked about some of the kind of problems in terms of identifying when law grants rights. Actually, are they always granted to the people we think they're granted? And actually, who enjoys the benefits from these? And if nothing else, it's painting a picture that things aren't always that straightforward. So let's turn now to property. Let's think about how rules on property, how ideas of property can also play a role in determining who can access and use the ocean's resources. Right, here's where I'm probably going to trip myself up because I'm going to talk about something a little bit sophisticated and I'm not sure I entirely understand it myself. And this is because it's interdisciplinary research. So, I'm going to talk about the idea of constructing ocean space. Um, in law, we like a simplistic life. We like statutes, we like cases, we interpret them, we apply them. But in other disciplines, they have a little bit more focus on theory and construction. Sorry to the law school there, I know that's not true, but I'm just trying to win some favours here easily. Okay, so the construction of ocean space. So the idea is that space is not just simply a fact. It's not just simply an object which has things done to it. That actually space is something which is constructed through the interaction of natural or material processes and social processes. A really simple example, your house and your home. A house is an object. It's a building with a roof and windows and a door. Your home is a place where you live. A home, in a sense, might be a constructed space because it's something which is the result of the interaction between natural, the house, and social processes, the family, society. So actually, how we understand it and how we use it as a space is the product of those sets of relations. Now, this is not just a static process. When we construct space, it's an iterative process. It's something which continues to evolve. We lived in caves, then in mud huts, then in houses, then in skyscrapers, and potentially in the future we might all live in communal buildings under the sea. Who knows? But as society develops, as technology develops, the way in which we construct space develops. 
But actually, the construction of space generates new possibilities. Another example, fisheries. In the days of old, the oceans were regarded as being a common space, at least before Spain and Portugal and the UK got there. They were a common space. They were open to all, subject to freedom of fishing. So that was how we designated that space as a kind of legal construct. So we've got the oceans as a common space. But by designating the oceans as a space, we began the process of changing the nature of that space. When something is a common space, anybody can use that. And so as more and more people started to use the oceans to catch fish, as technology developed and we're able to capture more and more fish, eventually it resulted in a state where we were overexploiting our fisheries. So we started to change the nature of the space. It's not just simply a designation as a legal, legal label. We actually caused fish stocks to deplete because of the way in which we constructed that space. But of course, we react to that. And so part of the process of reacting to that depletion of a resource is to then try and limit use, to carve up the oceans. And so we see the process of dividing up the oceans into spaces of exclusive control, where we could limit access and use. And so that then becomes the regime which I talked about, EZs, all these exclusive areas which are allocated to states. But that in turn then generates its own problems. Because as soon as we start drawing lines in the ocean, we create boundaries. And when we have boundaries, we have boundary problems. Fish. Brexit. Everybody saw the famous pictures of Brexit fish waving their UK passport saying we're British fish. But of course that's not true. Fish don't respect human-made boundaries. And so by creating boundaries between states, we then start to create other problems, problems of straddling stocks, shared resources. And so that then creates conflicts, and we have to respond to this by creating mechanisms of control. So coming back to the whole point here, that space is a product. It's a constructed regime partially to do with the material nature of the space, but partially to do with the social processes which we apply to it. And it's continual and it's evolving. I'm hoping you realize the reason why we put the Dubai palm there. It's you know, construction at sea, sorry, um, you know, just in case. All right, but when we think about the oceans as a space where we construct social relations, we have to be sensitive to the nature of ocean space. Because if we're not sensitive to the nature of ocean space, we get things wrong and we cause problems. Overexploitation of fisheries, boundary disputes are some of the examples of that. And traditionally, the reason why we tend to get things wrong is because we treat the oceans like land territory. We carve it up, we delimit it, we draw boundaries. But of course, the oceans aren't like that. The oceans are a different space. They are fluid. They are dynamic, they are ever-changing. If you think about drawing a boundary on the oceans, you're not really fixing a space, are you? Because the currents in the ocean continue to move across that boundary. And also, when we think about the oceans, we're not just thinking about the oceans as water, we're thinking about them as natural environments, as ecosystems. And one of the things that science is telling us now is that actually the processes in the ocean are so fundamentally connected that it's very, very difficult to separate them out. We can go hunting for cod, but if we ignore all the species that cod predate on, then we're going to cause the collapse of that stock. If we think about global warming, we're raising the temperatures of the oceans, and that's causing species to redistribute. So we've got quite complex natural processes taking place in the oceans. Now, that sounds fairly straightforward, but the problem is that when we start to divide the oceans up, we start to break them down. We start to run counter to those kind of natural conditions. If we give some resources to one state and other resources to another state, can they really regulate or control these without cooperation, without degrading the environment? So we need to be sensitive to these types of interaction when we're constructing ocean space. Because if we don't, we will get things wrong 
and that way leads to disaster. Now, just a, almost a kind of bit of a summary here. When law has been involved in the construction of ocean space, when we've tried to define legal regimes which help us make use of resources, allow access to resources, it's done so often in a way which is not sensitive to the nature of those resources. And there are a couple of things where law has traditionally gotten things wrong. The first of these is that it tends to treat all spaces the same. So in the kind of little diagram there, it's as close to Churchill and Lowe's I've got there, Duncan, sorry, so it's just for you. Um, that's your kind of typical way of delimiting the kind of coastline. So you can imagine you're standing on line, you're looking out to sea, and around the country, you've got these bands of waters out to 12 and 200 nautical miles. But those basic rules apply to all states equally, regardless of their geography, regardless of the ecological conditions in those waters, regardless of who uses those waters. It's simply a flat set of rules applied to ocean space. Law tends to ignore the specificities of individual spaces. So again, another case here, Dudley and Stevens, the famous cannibal case. Some sailors were shipwrecked at sea, and in order to survive, they did what everybody would do naturally, they ate the cabin boy. Um, they came back um, to, to land, and they were prosecuted for murder. Slightly kind of macabre, but the point I'm making here is that the law, the criminal law at the time, would apply equally to what happens at sea, regardless of the exigencies of the situation. So law ignores sometimes the specificities of place, locality, event. It's a little bit neutral or unrefined in that respect. And then the last of these is King Canute. I, I like this one, it's my favorite one. So you're aware of the legend of Canute here. The idea was that he sat himself down on the coastline and commanded the sea to stop and to, the tide to retreat. Um, and he did this not because he was suffering from massive hopeless, <coughs> but because he wanted to demonstrate to his courtiers that sometimes the remit of natural man-made authority has boundaries. The idea is that certain things are beyond our control. So when we think about regulating the oceans, it's no good having a rule which commands the tides to stop. It's no good having a rule which, for example, divides the oceans in ignorance of ecosystems because they will still continue to happen regardless of what law does. So law tends to ignore, or at least historically has tended to ignore, those subtleties um, in space and in practice. So property. I need to add a little bit of a caveat here. So far, I've really been talking about state and state control. And this is fine because under international law, international law is basically about interactions between states, and states enjoy sovereignty and control and jurisdiction. They don't tend to enjoy ownership of spaces. So when I've been talking about France owning the oceans or the UK owning the oceans, you know, a bit of a misnomer there. Actually, they exercise authority, sovereignty, or jurisdiction over these activities. So I'm not really talking about property so far, but, I think we can still think of property and we still can talk about property because, as I indicated, it's not just states which enjoy control of the oceans. But actually, when we think about how states justify their claims, how they generate these claims to ocean space, we can understand it in property type terms. Because ultimately, property is all about excludability, your ability to exclude through law access to a particular resource. And when we think about states, that's pretty much exactly what they're doing. Now, it's not just me that's telling you that. There's many eminent jurists going back to people like Hirsch Lauterpacht, who talked about international laws being the kind of product of private law sources and analogies. And part of the reason for this is because law doesn't exist in a vacuum. We draw upon whatever legal material is to hand in order to help us explain the world. International law was largely a product of the 17th, 18th centuries, but in order to kind of formulate the basic rules on what states could and couldn't do, they drew upon canonical law, domestic law, and including property institutions. Every country in the world has a concept of property. Every country in the world has a legal system with property rules. And so it's no surprise that international law has developed on lines at least analogous to the way in which property has developed. I like this picture. Um, so it's, it's James Gilray there. So it's the idea of um, the plum puddings fit to burst here. 
back in the kind of mid 19th century, states carving up the world between them, just in the way that we kind of carve up the land between us in terms of, of property there. So echoes of that. A bit Eurocentric, mind you, but well, that's uh, something that we have to live with and redress. Okay, so ownership. So when we think about ownership, I think we're all familiar with property in kind of general terms. We might own a car, we might own a house, a laptop, a pen, a mobile phone. But property is not some single monolithic concept, is it, Martin? Land lawyer at the back there, so. Okay, so property is a complex set of legal relationships here. The idea is actually, although we have a concept of property, property itself, at least in legal terms, is understood as a series of dual relations. And what do we mean by dual relations? We actually mean that property is a bundle of different rights, entitlements, and responsibilities. So um, a famous legal scholar, a philosopher, um, Honoré developed the idea of the incidence of ownership. And what he did was to break down this monolithic concept of property into its incidence. So typically, property, in varying degrees involves the right of possession. This is my clicker. It's the right to use something. Oh, look, I'm going backwards and forwards. Nobody's telling me what to do. I have that authority because I'm the owner of my clicker. Oh, spoiler alert there. So philosophy coming your way. Um, it's the right to manage, to make decisions about how your resource can be used. It's the right to income if you want to lease something out. It's the capital, your ability to use or even destroy your property. You can burn your house down if you want. Um, it's the right to security. The state will guarantee or will make available you can use your house as security. Transmiss trans sorry, I'm getting tired now. Transmissibility, the idea that you can pass possession of your property over. Absence of terms, the idea, well, well let's not go into the absence of terms. Um, Non-harmful use. I've got this one underlined here because actually Everything so far has been rights, entitlements, and claims. It takes us to get to number nine, where we actually find the first rule of property, which suggests that you're not allowed to use your property in a way which is harmful to others. You've also got liability to execution, so if you do something wrong, somebody can take your property away from you. And then last but not least, you've got residuarity. The idea that your property, if you do something with it, you loan it, you lend it, it's used um, to execute some debts on, if all other claims have been exhausted, it will come back to you, so it bounce back effect here. So even in law, what we have here is the notion of property, which is very much focused on rights and claims exclusive entitlements, but with one balancing no harm use there. And that, I would suggest here, renders property very much useful for that kind of process of commodification that I talked about earlier on. The idea that claims are made, we commodify things, we see them as objects of value, and we use and exploit them. All right, so that's a little bit about property. Now, property doesn't exist in a vacuum. Property exists because society decides that property is a useful institution. And fundamentally, property is a legal regime which governs the relationships between people in respect of things. And that's quite an important distinction. Property is a legal relationship between people in respect of things. Property is not directly me and a relationship with a thing. It's a relationship between members of society and a thing. The property itself is the object of legal relations. It's not the subject of them. And that's quite important here. And the reason why we have property is because we need to decide how best to distribute the world's resources between us to avoid conflict and so on and so forth. So a number of theories have been put forward which seek to kind of explain and justify why we have this regime of property. And we can see echoes of how these apply to ocean spaces. So let's take, for example, John Locke and his labor theory. This was something which is derived from natural rights. The idea is that each and every single one of us has property in our own body. My body is my own, and I can do with it what I will. It's kind of derived from the idea of inherent equality of all individuals, and no person is able to dictate what another person does with their body. But the idea of the labor theory is that if I have property in my body, then when I do something with my body, then I invest the labor of my body into that thing. And if I own my body and I invest my labor into something, then I'm entitled to the product of my labor. So for example, a farmer who tills his field is that labor which justifies his entitlement to his property. So the idea of 
the labor theory, is that if we do something to the real world, if we capture it, if we hunt, if we harvest it, if we go fishing, then that generates a legal claim to it. But there are problems with the labor theory of property, and there are some caveats to this. So for example, a couple has sex, they have a child. Is the child the product of their labor? And does it have its own autonomy? So there are limits to the way in which the natural rights theory might apply. There are also ones which Locke recognized. The idea behind the labor theory is that it has certain limits. Just because you labor on something doesn't necessarily mean you will always get everything that you labor on because ultimately that may reduce the amount that's left over for others. So we've got the caveat, the Lockean proviso, that you can labor on something and you can own something, but only so far as enough and as good as left over for others, because that would result in the destabilization of society. Equally, you're not allowed to accrue things beyond their ability to survive. So if you harvest too many things and they spoil, it's morally wrong for you to keep those things. So, Although that justifies the institution of private property, there are some caveats and exceptions to this which are there to benefit others and society more generally. The other problem is that um, you can do the wrong thing with your labor. You can capture people, you can subject them to slavery. So the idea is that labor in and of itself isn't sufficient. It has to be productive or socially beneficial labor. So it wasn't until maybe the 20th century when somebody like Munzer came along where he combined labor with dessert. And it's the idea that only socially productive labor entitles you to claim something. So if you're fishing and you overexploit things, it's not socially productive, so should you catch what you keep what you catch? So we can see how these might apply. So that's the natural rights theory of property. The next theory of property is the liberty-based approach here. Now, I'll quickly deal with this one. The idea of liberty accounts of property is that basically, unless people have access to certain material resources, they will not be able to function as social agents. If I'm beholden to Karen for my food, if I'm beholden to Duncan for the house, then they will be able to pressurize me and ask me to do things I might not otherwise want to because the means of my existence are dependent upon their will. So the idea is that liberty justifies the granting of certain property to individuals because it enables them to be political actors. Straightforward, so if we look at the oceans, we think, for example, the claims that states make or that individuals make, the fisherman who goes to sea, he needs to fish to earn money to survive, but also to be a socially productive actor. If we think about states, they make claims to ocean spaces because without access to resources, they may be dependent on others. So when we looked at, for example, the generation of exclusive economic zones throughout history, these were actually very much driven by developing states who made the argument that without control of their coastal waters, their economies would not be strong enough and they would be dependent on the charity and benefit of more powerful states. So liberty justifies some claims. But there are problems with liberty because liberty, whilst it might justify control and access to resource, liberty can be secured through other means. It doesn't just have to be a system of private property. Why not common property? If our material needs are being met through a system of common property, through social security, do we really need private property? And there's also the problem that liberty resists patterned redistributions of wealth. Liberty often requires us to resist harmful or at least restrictive interferences by the state. So in this kind of tradition, property has been seen as a bulkhead against intrusion by the state. It gives us the power to resist the state. But in order to protect that, it resists the redistribution of wealth. So most libertarians struggle with the idea of how to reconcile the liberty notion of property with the distribution of wealth in order to meet social or other needs. There is a public dimension to it, but it's one which is not particularly well articulated. Utility, the idea of welfare maximization here, the greatest good of the greatest number. The idea is that somehow, um, we need property because it enables us to maximize our well-being. As Aristotle said, if we don't have private property, we will have conflict over natural resources. So property, the idea to delimit through law certain entitlements, helps us reduce conflict. Um, we've got Hume. The idea is that property um, is really just security of expectations. 
as individuals, we need to plan for our lives. We need to be able to look to the future and do things. And we can only do that if we have security of expectations. And property, by guaranteeing to individuals the return from their things, helps secure those expectations. And then most famously, we've got Bentham. I love this picture of Bentham, the auto icon. This statue, his body is um, on display at UCL in London, a man who's committed to his cause in the favor of science here. Again, Bentham was a strong advocate of this utilitarian notion of property. So, property exists because it benefits society. But of course, the problem with utilitarianism is that it can result in decisions which are harmful to particular goods, to, to particular parts of society. If you're doing something which benefits the majority, what about the minority? Utilitarianism has its own flaws as a justificatory regime. The next of the regimes we've got are economic approaches to property. Um, I love this one. There's a book by Rongvar Hannesson who basically wrote a, a treatise on why we should privatise the oceans. And there are kind of two lines of argument which he proposed here. And the idea here is that we need to privatise the oceans, we need private property because it's about the efficient use of resources and it's about preventing destructive competition for resources. So part of his work here is based upon the seminal tragedy of the commons by Garrett Hardin in 1969. Um, the idea of the tragedy of the commons is that if we have land which is open to all and we're entitled to graze our cattle on that land, then ultimately this will lead to the degradation of that resource. And the kind of logic behind this is that if you graze your cattle on land for free, you get the benefits of fat cattle grazing on that land but you don't pay for the costs of that. They are basically defrayed across all members of society who have access to this common land. So ultimately, because we're all rational actors, we like something for free, we graze and graze and graze and graze and eventually the common land is depleted. And the only way to prevent this is to basically introduce private property to stop that overuse of resource, to allow certain people to exclude others from access to the resource. That happened with cattle, but it's also happened with fish stocks, the common fish stocks problem that I talked about earlier on. And the other argument behind this is that also by creating private property, it allows for the most efficient use of resources. Property rights are marketable, we can transfer them, and ultimately property rights will accrue in the hands of those best placed to make use of them. It's the foundations of the market system, and that results in the most efficient allocation of resources. So that's worked so well, more generally, so let's privatise the seas. Well, maybe not. Another lesser known justification for property is property as propriety. This is often associated with civic republicanism. And the idea here is that we give property to those persons who are best able to make use of it for society. For example, the homeowner enjoys property in their home because it allows them to do the things which are required done at home. The farmer owns his land because he produces food for society. The fisherman owns the fish because he catches that and brings that food home for society. So the idea here is that you give property to those best able to make use of it. And this is often associated with stewardship. The idea that those people who have control of things because of their position are also under responsibilities to make best use of that for the benefits of society. Now, it's a great idea, it's a great ideal, but the problem that we have with it is that how do we get those persons to ensure that they act on behalf of those they are meant to be acting for? If you're the steward, who requires you to do the things that you're stewarding for? In the absence of strong legal systems, these things don't work. So what does property tell us? Well, most of the systems, the justifications of private property, tend to prioritise private rights and excludability for individuals, but also for states-type claims. There's another problem with um, the kind of justifications for property. is that whilst property is a social construct, most of the justifications are ones which are designed to enhance individual benefits and not collective benefits. And in the absence of strong controls, either upon individuals or upon states, if we have no strong public values which we're pursuing through the institution of property, we tend to find that property runs amok and it's problematic. Then the last point I wanted to make here was that oceans are an object of social processes. Again, throughout history, the way in which we treat the oceans has been the object of human relations. We impose our wills, our values onto it, and we don't understand it as part of a more interactive, coherent approach. <coughs>
So what we have then is a system of property, a system of state control, which is ultimately led, I think, to the degradation of the oceans because it's pushing the wrong sets of values. So where does that take us? Well, we've got to think a little bit more constructively for the future. So um, a couple of kind of just reminders there, sort of summary points. The first of all, law, hand of history, heavy on our shoulders. What's been done in the past continues to be done, and the institutions of property and control have tended to accrue wealth in the hands of some states, of some individuals. Most of the law that we have on the oceans is resource oriented. It's all about exploiting and extracting. And when we think about all the justifications that have been advanced for this, they tend to be used in an extractive or partial manner. We don't always add the caveats, the kind of public constraints on property. So how do we respond to that? Well, here's where things get imaginative. Um, a couple of kind of recommendations for the future. The first thing that we need to do is to think a little bit differently. We need new imaginaries. If we do things the way they've always been done, then we're going to repeat the mistakes of the past. So what we have here is some artwork by um, a Swedish artist called Simon Stallinghart. And what he was basically commissioned to do was to kind of create some images about what potential future visions for the oceans um, and what they might look like. Um, so on the kind of top left there, we've got the oceans as kind of um, commodified. Factories at sea, capturing and processing fisheries, reducing it to consumption products for consumption, a fairly bleak dystopian future. Below that, we've got the oceans, um, it's called the rhyme of the ancient mariner, a parody on the past one, where basically you've got an individual sailing at sea in a depleted ocean trying to find whatever's left over amongst the hulks of our industrial wreckage. These are kind of pathways which if we commit to, if we continue to overexploit, we could potentially lead ourselves towards. But on the left hand side of the slides here, we've got some more optimistic opportunities. On the bottom, we've got oceans of the future. Um, and here we've got the idea that individuals through technology are thinking of new ways in which to interact with the oceans, to rebuild natural habitats, to view them as processes, as structures, as ecosystems of value in and of themselves, and not just as things to be consumed. And then above that, potentially, in the weird and distant sci-fi future, we'll be living closer to the seas. Part of the problems that we have as society is that the oceans are distant from us. 30 odd miles that way to the North Sea. Most of us don't interact regularly with the oceans. We don't have close relations with the oceans. So part of this is about strengthening and structuring and participating in the process of law creation. And through that, we can help construct new ways and new visions for the future. Anyway, I think I'm probably out of time, so I'm gonna stop there. Uh, and thank you for your attention. So.